Hi, welcome to pause. This is the first lecture on the lecture series of topic elliptic curves with complex multiplication. So the goal of today is for me to explain my title, namely, what are elliptic curves and what do we mean by complex multiplication? So uh, the, the title for the lecture today is called the elliptic curves and their endomorphisms. Namely, I will introduce the object elliptic curves and then tell you what the structure of their endomorphism rings looks like. And complex multiplication is a property for the curves uh, on their endomorphism rings. Okay, so let's start with explaining what is an elliptic curve. So definition, an elliptic by elliptic curve, elliptic curve defined over some field K is a pair E comma O, where E is a smooth projective curve of genus one. Curve of genus one. And the O, oh, that is a smooth projective curve of genus one defined over our field K. And the O is a K point on E. If, if the characteristic if the characteristic of my field K is not two or three, which we can currently use as a rounding assumption to make our life easier, then E has a has an alpha equation. Has an alpha equation of the form y square y square equals to x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are in k. Okay. Then, and moreover, uh, the place the the point O is. Uh, is the unique point is placed at infinity, meaning that this is a smooth urban curve leading in A2. And I can take its projective closure in P2. And uh, and so at, so at infinity, there is a unique point in this closure that is not in this urban patch. And that point is exactly the point O that we, we know about. Such a defining equation is called the Wallstrass equation. So it contains the information of um, the curve. It tells you the smooth genus one curve, and also when it tells you which which is a specified point, namely the point at infinity. So sometimes uh, you people will just say that the curve is is a curve defined by this equation, and by that they they implicitly has specified the point O by the point at infinity. Okay, so since I have, since E is a algebraic curve of genus one, so E has genus one. Then we know that the space of holomorphic differentials Uh, form a one-dimensional k-vector space. Okay. So which we will denote it by denote it by v, simply by v. This is the only vector space we will be discussing in this whole in this lecture. So when I write the, when I write v, I mean the one-dimensional k-vector space of holomorphic differentials on E. And if E is given by the explicit defining equation, y squared equals to x cubed plus ax plus b, then we, we know a, a holomorphic differential. Then if you look at the uh, omega, then omega, which equals to dx over y, 
this this differential is holomorphic and non vanishing. No man issue. So, so the vector V is nothing but uh, it's it's spanned by omega. So it's just A omega, where A is our element in K. So they're very explicit. It's the one dimensional vector space, very explicit. Okay, so this is what, uh, so this you can think, so the first definition of a curve, the first way you think about the curve, is a smooth algebraic curve of genus one, and it has a specified point O. Okay, next we will think about the curve. Uh, another special thing about the curve is that it is an algebraic group. So it is a curve, so algebraic groups. So by that, we, we can think about, uh, we can consider the Abel Jacobi map, namely, consider consider the Abel Jacobi map B, which maps K bar points of E to um to the uh, to the divisor class group. Of, of E. Take note of E. Very concretely, I take any point, any geometric point P, and then map it to the degree zero divisor P minus O, where O is the fixed point we already know about. And then bought out principal divisors, so we map it to the divisor class given by P minus O. So the so special thing about this map is that because E has genus one, so this map is actually a bijection. So this map is a bijection. And thus, the group law, the group law on the divisor class group gives you a group law on the set of geometric points of E. induced a group law on the set of geometric points on E. And um, what's important is that there are two things that's important about this group law. So number one, this the, the group this group law is algebraic. Meaning that the multiplication E cross E to E and the so taking inverse e to e by, so this is by, if I take two points, pq, and map it to p plus q via the group law on pick naught, and also the so taking inverse p maps to p inverse, both are algebraic maps. This is the first important thing about this group law. And the second important thing is that this group law is defined over the ground field K. So this two are very, and the reason, the reason it's defined over K is essentially because our fixed point O the map that identifies a identifies a geometric point on E with a point on pick not of E, this upper Jacobi map is by using the base point O, which we already assume to be defined over the base field. So this group law is defined over K. Okay, so these two things are, are very important. And in general, um, algebraic varieties with a group law with the algebraic varieties, I'm oh, sorry, projective, projective varieties with a group law are exactly called, uh, exactly the object abelian varieties, which is the topic of the coming Arizona school.
And the elliptic curve is a one-dimensional special case of an abelian variety. OK, great. So now I have introduced what a elliptic curve is. So there are two ways to view elliptic curve. First of all, you can view it as an algebraic curve, a smooth algebraic curve, a generous one with a mark point. And the second way is to view it as a group. It is it's a the set of geometric points on E forms a group. And well, since it's a group, you also have a have a uh, have a special element, namely the identity. So that's a marked point on the on the elliptic curve. So these two perspectives are very important in studying the curves. And essentially, this is what makes the elliptic curve um so important because. When you have higher genus curves, you can't have a group law on the set of points. But when you have abelian varieties, they are having they are, their dimension is higher, they're not algebraic curves, so it's more complicated to study them. Okay, so after introducing an object, the next step is to introduce the morphisms between, between these objects. So morphisms uh, between these curves. Okay, so essentially, morphisms, since we said that we can view the curves from these two different perspectives as algebraic curves and as groups. So morphisms between the curves, we want to respect both structure. Okay, such morphisms are called isogenies. Definition, isogeny. Okay, okay. so its definition is that a morphism between two elliptic curves okay let's see the first elliptic curve let's call it e101 and second elliptic curve e202 is called an isogeny If it's an algebraic morphism, if it is an algebraic morphism, which maps O1 to O2. Okay, so I have an algebraic curve with a marked point maps to another algebraic curve with a marked point. So it is natural to ask morphism, it's natural to start in morphisms between them, which maps the marked point to a marked point. Right. Such maps are called um, isogeny. And um, there, is, uh, there is one map which maps, okay, so the map, so the isogeny, which maps the whole E1 uh, to the point, O2 is called the trivial isogeny. It's called trivial isogeny. Okay, so the important thing about isogenies, which is not obvious from the definition, is that isogenies are group of are group homomorphism. Um, isogenies. Are group homomorphisms. So as long as as long as uh, as long as the algebraic maps that maps the uh, the or origin O one to the next uh, to the other map point O two, it actually automatically respects the group law. So I saw these are group homomorphisms. So um, which you can see that any non-trivial isogeny, also this is an observation, any non-trivial isogeny is a surjective map, surjective group homomorphism with finite kernel. Okay, 
this is what I mean by we really want to use both uh, both structures as uh, the, the two natures of elliptic curves to study them. Namely, elliptic curves are algebraic curves. So the maps we want to study are algebraic morphisms. Algebraic morphism between two smooth curves. Well, you either map map a point map a curve to a point, right? Or it's a map has to be dominant, has to be has to be has to be uh, surjective, right? And then moreover, because it's an algebraic curve, when it's not mapping the whole curve to a point, so it's a it's it's a finite map. It has to be a, it has to have finite degree. So thus, from a group homomorphism perspective, um, any non-trivial isogeny will be a surjective group homomorphism with finite kernel. Okay, so these are the morphisms we will study. Um, another thing is another important thing we want we need to know is that uh, because because isogenies are algebraic maps, it na it naturally induces maps on the pick knot of the elliptic curves on the uh, divisor class groups of those elliptic curves. So um, definition. Let me make a definition. Let phi. Uh, from E1 to T E2, let me omit the base point O1, O2. Be any be a non-trivial isogeny. Then it induces it induces a map phi upper star from the divisor class group of E2 to the divisor class group of E1. Okay. So this map, this is a pullback of, this is defined by the pullback of divisors. Namely, um, if I take any degree zero divisor of E2, I just take the, this pullback map is nothing but take the pre-image of each point in the support of that divisor. Then, um, uh, with multiplicity, then you will get another degree zero divisor, and because you can pull back functions, so this is actually a well defined map on the divisor class group. Okay, so then by by the identification of um, of the peak knot and the set of geometric points of the elliptic curve itself. So we, we get another isogeny, but now from E2 to E1. Okay. Yeah. Um, which we denote by, by phi hat. Okay. So this isogeny, this isogeny is induced isogeny. This isogeny phi hat from E2 to E1 is called the dual isogeny of phi. Okay. Okay. So whenever you have an isogeny from E1 to E2, it naturally comes with a dual isogeny from E2 back to E1. And moreover, let me write a lemma without proving it. You can explicitly work this out in the on the level of divisors. So if I if you compose if you compose an isogeny with this dual, what you will get is the is the iso is the, is the isogeny from E1 to itself by multiplying the degree of the map B. So this would be a E1 to E1 map. Multi multiply multiplication by the degree of the algebraic map phi. Okay. So uh, by multiplication, I just mean, uh, since we know that the EIs are, uh, the ge geometric points of E1 are abelian, form abelian group. And so you can you can multiply by, uh, uh, they are abelian group has A modules, right? So you can multiply by integer. So you multiply by degree phi. And this is the lemma I'm not going to prove. Okay, great. So now we have introduced the objects we want to study, namely elliptic curves, 
And we have also introduced the morphisms between them that we want to study, namely isogenies. Next, we can move on to the second topic of today is we want to determine the structure of the endomorphism ring of, um, for it curve. So let me first define what I mean by an endomorphism ring. Okay, so uh, notation or definition, I will denote by palm E1, E2, the set of isogenies from E1 to E2. And I will denote by end E, uh, end E is a set of isogenies from E to itself. Moreover, I will use notation, I will actually focus on today, I will actually, by default, I would be looking at isogenies defined over the base field K. But today we will be focusing on the endomorphism of E base change the algebraic load. I sort this of E um, base change to K bar. Okay, and the goal of today is to determine the structure determine the structure of and E K. Okay. Okay. So all the statements that tells you the structure of N E K are important. We'll do it step by step. Okay, step one. Okay, one. Um the the uh the set of authorities, this home set Palm E1, E2 um, is a free abelian group. Is a free abelian group with the with the addition law. With the addition law on the target. Okay, addition law being that. Phi plus per C of a point P defined as phi of P plus per C of P. And the identity element is a trivial isogeny. If I consider phi m times a isogeny phi, um, this is the same as the composition multiplication by m, which itself is a so multiplication by m, which is a, itself is an isogeny from e two to e two, composed with an uh, isogeny phi. Okay. And this multiplication by m map, when m is not, so when m is not zero, the multiplication by m map is, is, is surjective. Okay. So then the composition of two surjective maps The composition of two dominant maps between algebraic curves uh, is dominant. Okay. So, so this shows you that um, the the abelian group of uh, the, the set of isogenies between two p curves forms a torsion free abelian group. And of course, this applies to N E. So, so the next step is now I apply to when I take E1, E2 to be the same little curve E, this actually shows us that 
it applies to NE. And moreover, NE, let me just always write E bar, K bar, why not? Um, even though I don't need K bar here, uh, NE is, um, is a, is, um, so we know that it is a torsion free of any group. Moreover, if we, if we consider um, composition as a multiplication, is as this and E is a is an integral domain. Is um, composition being multiplication? Composition as a multiplication. So it forms a ring. And it is a uh, integral domain, and the reason is exactly uh, it is the integral domain is it there's no zero divisors is exactly same as our previous proof. Um, if you compose to dominant mass, it's still dominant. You can't you won't will never get the trivial isotropy, which shrinks the whole curve uh, to a single point. Okay, so this is the first statement about the endomorphism. As it is the morphism ring of, of EK. So it is a ring, first of all, and moreover, it is an integral domain. Okay, so we are one step there. So now let's think about let, now let's try to start the structure of this ring. So um we will need some tools. So first of all, let's think about the holomorphic differential, the vector space that we mentioned before. Um okay, so let's E1, E2, uh, B, two identity curves. The any isogeny will Then an isogeny phi from E1 to E2 induces a map well which I'm also using the unforced notation of phi upper star, a pullback, from the space of holomorphic differentials on E2 to the holomorphic differentials on E1, from V2 to V1. Okay. okay. And, okay, so then let me first write down some lemmas. So lemma, if, if E is given by the Wiles-Ross equation as we introduced, Y squared equals to X cubed plus AX plus B, and let my omega, be the holomorphic differential dx over y as we introduced, then what's special about this omega is that then omega is translation invariant. Okay. It means that uh, let's forget about the group structure for now. Let's forget about using isogeny. Um, I, if I just think about E as an algebraic curve, I have a map from E to itself, which is by translating by a point, by any point P, because we just discussed that the addition law is a algebraic morphism on E, right? So it is not an isogeny because it maps the identity O to P, right? It's not an isogeny, but it is a very valid map on algebraic curves. And um, then the induced map on the on the holomorphic differentials, it actually preserves omega. So that's something special about omega. So sometimes people call this omega invariant differential. Okay. Okay, so then um next this is something about special about omega. Next the, the is the theorem is that now let's think about um what uh let's think about if i have two isogenies okay so let's 
fail per se, the isogenous from E1 to E2 and consider phi star per C star as morphisms on holomorphic differentials V1 map to V2 as an induced maps. Then, then phi plus per C, uh, the, the induced map phi plus per C on omega equals to phi pullback omega plus per C pullback of omega. Okay, so moreover, this tells us that the end E um, to the endomorphism of this K vector space is uh, from phi map to phi star is a ring homomorphism. Um, okay, so two things. So first of all, why is this important? Well, because V is a one-dimensional k-vector space, and we know the endomorphisms of a one-dimensional k-vector space is it's isomorphic to k, right? It's isomorphic to k, okay? So now we actually found a map, a ring homomorphism from the endomorphism uh, ring of E to, this, to, to our field k and the ring homomorphism. Moreover, we understand the kernel. Okay, the kernel of this homomorphism, the kernel is the set of inseparable, um, is a set of inseparable morphisms. Okay, what do we mean by inseparable? Well, these two, this, uh, so when I have a morphism between two algebraic varieties, it induces a morphism on their function field. And this is the field extension. So when this field extension is an inseparable field extension, we say that this morphism is inseparable. Okay, so for example, a corollary, the important corollary is the following. Corollary is that if if K is a character if K is a field of characteristic zero, well, then we don't need to worry about inseparable morphisms. Then, well, the ring we care very much about and E K bar embeds into K bar. So in, so in particular, now we know that an EK bar is commutative in this case, when characteristic is zero. Okay, great. So uh, moving on. Now, uh, so here, up to here, we have been, in, so this, this conclusion, we, may, we mainly use the fact that the elliptic curves are algebraic curves. As I said, we have two tools, right? El yeah. Elliptic curves being algebraic curves and the elliptic curves as groups. So this is, we use some tools from the algebraic curve side. Next, let's recall that elliptic curves are groups and use, use those tools. Okay, so recall. So from from the first isomorphism theorem, theorem of groups, which says that if I have any group homomorphism phi from a group G to a group H, right, I get that um, G mod out the kernel of phi is isomorphic to the image of phi, which will be a subgroup of H, right? Okay, so this means that if I want, but 
in our case, first of all, we will have a group homomorphism. So this is not just any, this is for any group hom. Okay. For us, what's special is that we will always be surjective. So for us, so for any phi inside and well, if I don't think about the trivial isogeny, uh, inside an EK bar is surjective. Okay. Okay, great. So that means uh, if I want to start the elements in n e k bar up to a automorphism of E, I only need to classify the kernels, right? And moreover, because my because my maps are algebraic curves, so I only care about the kernels which are finite groups. So kernel phi, um, the kernel phi I care about will be finite subgroups. of my EP curve, okay? If I want to classify starting elements in, in the in end E, what I, what I need to start are essentially the finite subgroups of, of EK bar, okay? Or in other words, uh, torsion subgroups of EK bar. Okay, so let's think about what torsion structure looks like. Okay, so lemma, so what are the elements in E that has finite order? Well, lemma, um, let M be an integer, uh, be an integer co-prime to the characteristic of K. Characteristic of K, then, we know that E K bar of the elements of okay, so these these are the um points um in you know, having order D that divides them. Okay. So this group um the, the subgroup, which is annihilated by multiplication by M, or sometimes often called the M torsion subgroup, is isomorphic as a group, isomorphic to Z mod M Z squared. Okay, so let's prove this. So element note, note that the multiplication by M map if I take its dual, is itself is still multiplication by m. This you can check following the definition of a dual isogeny. Following its construction, um, coming from the the map on the divisor class group. Okay, uh, for any m. For all m. Okay. Uh, so since m is co-prime. To the characteristic of K, uh, this multiplication by M map is separable. Is separable. Um, so we know that the uh the E torsion, so this E K bar, and this subgroup was its size. Well, exactly equals the size of E as a group mod ME, right? And that equals to the uh, the degree of my multiplication by M map. And that is nothing but M squared. Okay? Because, uh, because we know that um, Because we know that by okay by the lemma on the dual isogeny, we know that M dual composed with M is given by this equals to the degree of M square. Uh, sorry, degree of M. This isogeny given by multiplication by degree of M. But on the other hand, we also know that this is nothing but M square. So the degree of M 
the multiplication by m map is exactly m squared. Okay, so that's the proof. Great. So now we know, now we roughly know the, the structure of the elements in E with the finite order. Okay, so how do we use this to study the set of endomorphisms? Okay, so, well, the next thing, so this is the end of proof. Any isogeny, any isogeny phi from E1 to E2 will induce, induces, since this group are group homomorphisms, I induce map between the torsion subgroups. Any M. The, and moreover, the important thing which I'm not going to prove to you is that for any prime L, which is co prime to the characteristic, the characteristic of um, of K, um, there is a injection. Namely, how um, E1, E2, E2, the ZL vector spaces by taking the L infinity torsion. So the idea is the following. The idea is that if I if I have a um ah, so the point is the following is that Let's say I have an isogeny. I want to recover the information of an isogeny. So the point is, if I know where it maps the L torsion points, um, it, it, how it maps the L torsion points to a set of L torsion points on E2, well, L torsion points has, uh, we already know that has L square points, right? I know how to, how I map these L square points, right? But then when I read to L square, well, now I have L to the fourth many points that I need to specify how they map to the, uh, the other curve. And when I read this power higher and higher, eventually I'm specifying how to map infinitely many points onto the other curve. But my map is the algebraic curve. If I know how to map infinitely many points, it determines the map. This is really the philosophy, the idea behind this, if you think about it, right? So if I know the higher and higher orders of L torsion, which are infinitely many points, if I know how it, how it maps, then I have to, then it really pins down the map. That's why this is injected. Okay, so that's the idea. And moreover, I'm allowed to tensor up to QL, uh, so tensor up to ZL, and uh, on the left hand side and still be injected. Moreover, uh, the following map is also injected. You can check the proof of these statements in Silverman's the arithmetic recurves. Answer up to ZL. So the right hand side are homomorphisms between ZL vector spaces. So I tensor up the first one, which is just the Z module, uh, up to ZL. Sorry, uh, ZL module is not tensor up to. Okay, why is that important? Well, because because these things are um, rank two ZL modules. Okay. So this tells us that, so corollary, this tells us that the endomorphism of EK bar we already know it's a free Z module, it's a torsion free abiding group. Is a free Z module of rank at most four. Okay. Because the as ZL modules is this rank of this home is, is rank four. 
Great. There's another information about the endomorphism, uh, the endomorphism ring. Okay, now we are done with all the following, all the information we have gathered. Now we are ready to make our conclusion. So theorem. For a lipid curve, defined over field K, um, the endomorphism ring. And the bar is the only three possibilities is either isomorphic to okay one isomorphic to z two uh, isomorphic to an order of an imaginary quadratic field. Order of an uh, imaginary quadratic field or three, an uh, order of a quaternion algebra over Q. So moreover, there are only these three possibilities. Moreover, when K has characteristic zero, we know that, well, we know that the endomorphism K bar is commutative. Meaning that the third option does not is not valid. So it's either um, either Z or some O inside, which is order of a imaginary quadratic field. And if, if K is a finite field, then what happened is um, only two or three are possible. So either two or three. The reason is that this Z comes from multiplication or comes from what well, the endomorphism you always have as a free abelian group multiplication by integers. But if you are a finite field, you will always have the Frobenius endomorphism, which is purely inseparable. And, um, and you can show that the Frobenius uh, is not, um, no, it's not in Z. It's normally just not in Z. So it will give you a, so that it will always be bigger. The endomorphism for, for a big curve defined or finite field will always be bigger than, strictly bigger than Z. Okay, so, um, well, I'm not going to give you a full proof. Essentially, what's, so when I write proof, it just, it follows from, follows from, well, the structures of an E that we already learned. So and E is a free Z module of rank at most four. Okay. And also an integral domain. Okay. Two, uh, it has an evolution. So there is an evolution. There's a evolution on on and e. Okay. Namely, given by taking any phi to its dual isogeny. And three, um, it has a quadratic form. So for any 
I sort a fee, fee inside and E. So we know that fee composed with fee dual um, gives a gives a non-negative integer. So it's a non-negative integer. And so essentially has a norm map kind of thing. And also this integer is zero if and only if B is zero. Okay. With all these conditions, all these three conditions implies the, the type of implies the structure of the NE. And let's let me conclude by let me conclude by a definition. Um Given uh, so for an elliptic curve, curve E defined over a L where L is a number field. If if the endomorphism of E over L bar to use red and K. Is strictly greater than Z, or larger than Z, we see uh, we call E an elliptic curve with complex multiplication. Because um, so it means that the endomorphism ring of E over L bar is uh, is isomorphic to an order of an imaginary quadratic field. So this is where the complex comes from. So it's always a complex number. And why we call it multiplication, we will discuss next lecture. Uh, another thing is that as we've seen, if you have a curve defined over finite field, then its endomorphism ring will always be strictly bigger than Z. So sometimes people will also refer to that as complex multiplication, but um, it's less it's less meaningful, right? Because all any curve or a finite field will be bigger than Z. Well, what's more interesting is when the endomorphism is uh, actually is a ring uh, is rank two uh, order in an imaginary quadratic field or rank four, which is order of a quaternion algebra. Um, these two these two phenomena are called ordinary versus super singular, uh, which it is also a very interesting um, topic that we will discuss later in our class. Okay, thank you for this. Bye.